All right. When I say the word mighty, what comes to mind? Mighty? That's good. Yes. Hi. It's like word association when the definition is listed behind the word that you're looking up to define, right? Yeah? What comes to mind? I heard, I heard, I, I saw this action. Um, strong. The word mighty. Mighty mouse. Man. So, go ahead. Yep. That's, uh, that's scary, Marshall. But there it is, yeah. Uh, someone said ducks this morning. Mighty ducks, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's lots of things that when we think of mighty, I got to say, I remember watching. It was syndicated, obviously. But um, 1950s and 60s, Mighty Mouse came out. And uh, here I am to save the day, is, was his mantra. It was just this mighty mouse who went around beating up cats, I think, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so mighty, uh, lots of things. And um, if you were on Facebook yesterday and followed our page, you got a notification, uh, that question came out. It says, when you hear the word mighty, what comes to mind? And somebody says, well, since this is a church post, I think of God. And uh, that's, that's okay. The, uh, the reality is, is that what, that's what we're going to talk about. Our God is a mighty God. Maybe you remember as a kid singing that song, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. You remember that? A couple, maybe the nuances are slightly different, and um, maybe you remember, maybe not. I'm Getting some nods, and I'm getting some, you're crazy loco right now. It's okay. I remember that. So uh, our God is a mighty God. We find that reference uh, primarily um, since we've been looking at this passage of Scripture at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. That's the source of our content that we've been looking at here uh, on Sunday morning. And so I want to encourage you, if you brought your Bibles... Uh, You can turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. If you didn't, there's actually some there in the chairs in front of you today. Isaiah chapter 9, verse uh, 6. It's also be on the screen behind us, or behind me, in front of you. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, kind of towards the middle of the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. That's where our main passage is at. And in that... Uh, passage, as you're looking there, um, we find that our God is a mighty God. And, and uh, we read that last week. I want to encourage, I don't know if I actually have the reference on the screen there. Um, I don't have the reference on the screen behind me. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we have uh, the one, the government will be upon his shoulders and you shall call him wonderful counselor Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is, in the context of this, Isaiah is speaking a message to a king. And we looked a little bit historically at what's happening, and we talked about just the craziness of what's happening. If you were not here last week, just a really quick uh, recap. Isaiah is speaking to king. Uh, his name, This king is named Ahaz. He's in the southern a uh, portion of the what was at one point in time the nation of Israel globally that made up the the tribes of Israel Judah is the king of the king of that tribe Judah who has left after there's been a civil war and the northern uh, northern part and the northern tribes of the of the country split away and they follow after their own way Judah remains true Jerusalem there there's a king uh, and the promises of 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 Abraham and David, there would be a king there in, uh, in Jerusalem. We see this happening, and King Ahaz comes to uh, power. Um, it's about 730-ish B.C., if you're looking for that on a timeline. But through uh, poor leadership, and, and yet we see this up and down. Sometimes they were following gods, other times they were not. They fell into, especially when they were not following the Lord's instruction, they fell into disobedience, and they fell under attack from other nations, other surrounding nations as part of God's judgment against his people. But the Lord is faithful, and he promises to be with them and to 
to continue to preserve a remnant, at the very least, of his people always. And so we see this leadership and, and the nation becoming under attack and divided and being carried off into different uh, directions politically. They come under attack and fall underneath different rule. And we see in the, the north, in the northeast, there's this a country called the Assyrians, and they are rising to power. And over in, in the west, there's west and north, there's the country of Babylon and Egypt, and they're rising to power. And in the middle of those two large uh, c- countries that are coming to power, those governing nations trying to rule and vie for power, we've got uh, Syria and Israel and Aram right there in the middle, and then you've got Judah. And so what's happening is these great big countries are trying to vie for power, and yet they have their own problems, and they're trying to expand all of their borders, and at different times they try attacking Israel and um and Syria and the king of Aram, and we see those references in chapter 7 and 8 and 9 and following there. The king of Israel is Pekah, and the king of Aram is Rezin. And so what we see is they're under attack. They're under attack from Assyria specifically. And because they're under attack from Assyria primarily, they are trying to get Judah to help them ward off the attacks. You can imagine that if you need help. It's like uh, that TV show where you would phone a friend, right? I need help. I'm going to phone a friend. Well, they they phoned a friend down in Judah. They weren't really friends at the time, but uh, Judah said, no, I don't want to get involved. And so then they said, well, we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to come and we're going to conquer you. And then we're going to put our own puppet king in in rule in Jerusalem and over the nation of Judah. And then we're going to force you to fight with us. That's what's happening. So in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 6 Uh, we see that he's heard about this. King Ahaz has heard about this, and God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of that. And the reason for doing all of that is so that they could have an ally in defending off this country that wanted to come and overtake them. Now Ahaz, as the king in Judah, is a little bit worried, right? The, the, the political climate in this day and time was unstable, and he's just a small kingdom, and God comes to him through the prophet Isaiah and says, don't be afraid because of these two smoldering stumps. And he's actually making a reference to what would come in the future. He said, by the time you even are able to worry about it, it would it's not going to be a deal. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be just this... Uh, destruction-filled land, they're already going to be conquered, so don't worry about uh, being destroyed by them because they're going to be destroyed themselves. But, well, Ahaz worries about it. And, and the history here is significant. I mean, it's, it's fantastic as you study through this. Uh, I want to encourage you to read through this and study just what's happening historically. There are so many parallels, I think, for us today when we think about the things that we worry about, the things that we are consumed with, when we think about all of the different things that are happening politically and with different countries coming to power. It's just, it's significant. And I think the words are significant for us today when, and just let the, the word of God speak to us as he says, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart be faint. I think those are significant words. And why are these words important? Why are they significant for us today? Well, last week we said that he is our wonderful counselor. And so God spoke to Ahaz, this wonderful counsel, and he told him everything that he needed to know and what he should be worried about and not worried about and what would come about in his, in his plans in the future. And so this was the counsel. And so we talked about how we need to sit at the feet of our God who gives us wonderful counsel, counsel that is beyond description, beyond words, beyond what we can imagine. Uh, so sit at the feet of our Lord and his word and, and glean his counsel. But another reason as to why Ahaz is told not to be fearful or not to let our, his heart become worry-filled 
is that he is mighty God. He is mighty God. Isaiah 9, 6, his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And, and God is speaking very directly to King Ahaz, and he's saying, listen, I am mightier than the mightiest of nations. It's like Mighty Mouse. I'm here to save the day. I, I, I am King of kings, Lord of lords. I am mightier than, than what you're worried about. He's giving this uh, instruction to uh, King Ahaz that he is mighty God. And we see a record and example of this throughout the scriptures, uh, defining and reinforcing this truth that God is mighty God. Now, if, as a king, he would have been charged with the responsibility of knowing the books of the law. Now, we see throughout history that the kings didn't take time to actually study the words of the law. Uh, they ignored it. And in one instance, we see that they find the book of the law, and the king is, he is so distressed because he starts reading them like, oh, wow, we are so off course. And so maybe Ahaz falls into this category also. He has not been fulfilling his rightful responsibility as the king of his people to know the words of God. But throughout, if he would have known his, his country's history, which is so important even in our day and time when we think about the history that is trying to be changed of our country, without knowing the history, then we are susceptible to attack and susceptible to going astray. Because, well, we want to just devise our own history and we want to base our own future upon our own whims, not, not, not the education that God has given us through time. But if he had studied his history and if he had studied God's word, he would have known and heard of the examples that, of God's mighty power throughout the beginning of time. He would, have, he would have known and heard about how God sent a flood on all of the earth and yet rescued Noah. He would have heard of how God was faithful to Abraham and delivered him through all sorts of situations and circumstances. He would have seen and known that the examples in Egypt when God's people were enslaved, that God delivered them in a series of events that there is no way to explain other than the power of a mighty God. Can you, can you imagine experiencing all the plagues and hearing about all the plagues? And so when we get to the other end of that, he would have heard and studied Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17, where it declares that the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. This is written and declared through Moses when he comes down out of uh, Mount Sinai to the people. King Ahaz would have heard of that if he had studied his history and read the records of the accounts of scripture that was handed down to him as, as king. And he would have uh, seen how, uh, every, how God led, uh, his mighty God led his people through waters, flood waters, and made waters stand up in a heap and the, his people were able to cross on dry land. And he would have read of the mighty God who, who guided his people through a wilderness time with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. I mean, just try to wrap your mind around the might of a cloud and a fire moving and leading his people. He would, have, he would have heard of the city of Jericho as Joshua was told and commanded to go and to take the city, a fortified city, a well-fortified city that no man had really been able to overcome. And yet Joshua is told by the words of God to go and march around the city seven times and then blow your horns and all the walls will come down and then you can go in and overtake it. And that's exactly what happened. It doesn't make sense to the common man's understanding of natural events. It could only have happened by a mighty God. He would have heard of the supernatural events in history that just declared that this people, their God, is a mighty God. This people's gods is a God to be feared. He would have heard this. He would have known this. And... Uh, we see here the record of, of 2 Kings chapter 6, somewhere about 100 years earlier to his reign. Uh, another example of God displaying his might for a king where we see the messenger or prophet Elisha is declaring this, this word in 2 Kings chapter 6. It says, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And just a little background, there's this... 
uh, ensuing army that's going to consume the king, the, the city, and they're told to stand their ground and to fight, and the king's like, I can't, there's no way, they outnumber us. There's hundreds of thousands of soldiers, horses and chariots and armed men, mighty men, and we are just simple folk, we don't have these things. And well, Elisha says, alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with him. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And so the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. And so he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha, which is an example of God's pure might in a situation that seems hopeless. In an account that looked like, man, we're just the next bug splatter on this, on this uh, army moving through. And he's told not to be afraid. Because, well, God is going to move. God in his mighty power strikes the enemy with blindness and they end up retreating. And we see record before King Ahaz where David in Psalms chapter 30, uh, 45 verse 3 describes God as mighty when he says, A gird your sword on, oh, on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and in your majesty, speaking of God. Are you getting a glimpse of the might of our God? And, and I know it's easy just to dismiss it as fanciful fairy tale as just some old archaic book that really doesn't have any significance in history or time today. And we hear that in our culture all around us, and maybe you're at that spot. But I want to, if that's your premise, or if you're listening and that's your premise, I, the Word of God is an actual historical account. It is not fanciful fairy tales of legends of old that have been passed down throughout generations where the story just gets bigger and bigger and bigger like your, like your last year's fishing trip. It's actual account. It actually happened. It records what happened in real people's lives. And we can go throughout history in other uh, countries' documentation, in other books of history, and we can see that the Bible confirms and aligns with historical documents throughout history. The Word of God, the accounts that we read here today of what happened, actually happened. And it's amazing And it's beyond what our minds can sometimes comprehend, but it continually describes of our God, who is an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God, mighty God. His name shall be called Mighty God. He moves and he works. Now, just in case you're curious, these words, mighty God, in your English Bible right there, they do have a Hebrew meaning. And uh, the word mighty, there that Hebrew mean is gibor. And literally, the translators did well. It means mighty, right? That's why we have English translations of another language, because we take what it, what it means and we put it into a language we understand. It means mighty, great, strong, powerful, manly, chief, warrior, vigorous. These are all different places throughout the scripture where we see this Hebrew word translated into English. And it speaks of, um, even in times we see, you've heard of King David's mighty men or men of valor and how they did great things and they become men of legend. Well, this is another reference to that. Uh, This word is applied to Esau and Benjamin's massive armies of hundreds of thousands, which would describe an overwhelming great army. And so when we apply here, mighty God, our God is an overwhelming, great, powerful, strong. He is a warrior. This is who our God is. And then when it says God, the term is literally El, which is the general term for the word God, or even in some places, goddess. But it it describes of God, and it's the beginning word when we see the word Elohim and El Shaddai, and we start looking at all of the different characteristics that define God is, and and it gives another characteristic of who God is and, and the makeup of what he's like and his character and his nature. 
And here we see that applied. The, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz, and he says, the God that is speaking to you today through me is not just some God of nations who seem to be rising to power. The, the God that is speaking to you today is not just a God who is... Who is uh, set up in, in an altar and made of cast stone or, or gold or precious metals. The God who is speaking to you today is not some figment of your imagination that we've seen in, in worship for the sun or the moon or the night or fertility or the crops of the ground. The God that is speaking to you today, his name is Mighty God. And in the in the fiercest of battles, in the most worrisome of situations, when you're thinking through, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to respond? Ahaz says, trust in the Lord God, whose name is mighty, who has displayed his might throughout generations. He is a faithful God who is mighty. And so the problem that you face, King Ahaz, has a solution, and it's found in a mighty God. That's the practical application. This is the practical context of what Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz. And I would like to just challenge us to think through if we were in King Ahaz's situation, because we have been in in different things. We've seen pressures of life. We have worried about things. We have seen this overwhelming problem rise up, and we are left with the same invitation to trust in God, not just in, in the counsel that He would give us and how to deal with it, but also to trust that the problem that we're facing, it's nothing in the face and in the in the reality that we serve a God who is mighty and is going to lead us through that. Now, I say that, and yet when the problem that you're facing is like right here, it's hard to see. And it's, it's a rubber meets the road type of moment to, de to decide to trust in the Lord God who is the same God who delivered the Israelites out of the hand of Egypt, who is the same God who delivered them across the Red Sea, who is the same God who led them in the wilderness times, who is the same God who provided for them where their clothes did not wear out and they had food and they had water when they needed, who is the same God who, who declared victory over the enemies and he, and he continued to drive out the people who were wicked in the eyes of the Lord and... and and uh, continue to create a space and a hope and a future for his people. He is the same God that, that speaks to King Ahaz here in this moment and challenges him to be at rest, be at peace, for I am mighty God. And, it, and it's hard to, I understand, it's hard to say, well, how does that, what does it mean? What's it going to look like? And we see then King Ahaz's decision, and it's, and it's not unlike many of our own decisions. We've talked about it last week. King Ahaz, he looks at the nations, he looks at the threat, and he goes up to Assyria, or up to the Assyrian army, the king, and he takes out of the temple treasury tons and tons of silver and gold to pay tribute to them. And even declares to that king that I am your son and, and you, you are father. And so the Assyrians come and they defeat the little threat of Syria and Aram and Israel. But then because of his distrust, he, he speaks that to us in, in, uh, in chapter 7 and 8. Because of that distrust, well, Assyria eventually just keeps coming. And... He's overrun, and he's conquered. And the pressure that he faced was just a, well, a band-aid. And the ultimate solution, the promise that God gave him to say, look, I am mighty God. Don't worry about these two people. They'll be taken care of. And if you will trust in me, I will preserve you. Because I am mighty God. Look throughout history. Look at the armies that came upon my people, and when they trusted me, they were thwarted. That was the invitation. And yet Ahaz succumbs to the pressure and he makes a decision based upon his own understanding. 
and eventually it leads to his fall. And we like to look at King Ahaz and we like to say, foolish king, you just trusted God. And yet when we're dealing with life situations, whether it be a family argument, uh, a situation with our kids and, and, and their free will or our parents and their free will, <laughs> goes both ways. Uh, maybe it's deadlines at work and just the pressures and we just have to keep going. We just have to keep going and we have to sacrifice everything because that's what we just feel like we have to do. And, and we look at the debt that is around us and, and it's owed and it, that project, well, if I just keep working more hours, then I can pay down this debt and it's just overwhelming me. Or when we look at the political climate and we think and we start to worry about who's actually going to be president and what is actually going to happen after January comes and we don't have any clue what's going to happen? And we start to worry about whether there'll be more riots or more destruction. It starts to creep in and, and this spirit of fear can overwhelm us. And when we start to think about the economic situation, are we going to be able to, to work? Is the government going to allow us to work or not? Are we going to be able to, to freely gather and assemble and worship or not according to guidelines or not i mean it's still a challenge for us to to hear the words of god and to trust in him that as we follow him and surrender to him and know him as mighty god that he is the one who is over and more powerful than all of our worries and our fears God is still inviting us to see him as the one who delivers us from the hand of the pressers, just as he did with Ahaz. God is still inviting us to see him as the one who can lead us in the times of wilderness. God is inviting us still today to see him as the one who tears down walls and leads us into seasons of victory. God is still inviting us today to pray and to seek the mighty army of God who is really fighting our battles as we trust him and join him. And he is inviting each and every one of us to know him more and more deeply as the mighty God where there is nothing that stands against him. And Jeremiah the prophet in verse 32, verse, or chapter 32, verse 17. Now the prophet is describing it. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. And by your great power and, and by your outstretched arms, nothing is too hard for you. And so what is it that you feel is just overwhelming you, that is just too hard for you? And like the prophet Jeremiah, can you declare, Lord, this is overwhelming for me, but this is not too hard for you. Because I trust you as my mighty God. You have declared it and displayed it throughout the generations. So just take this. Because I don't know how to handle it. These words were spoken for King Ahaz, but they're spoken for us too. And as we look continually into the fulfillment of this, we find its, its power, this name applied to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our wonderful counselor and our mighty God. And in Luke chapter 1, in the, that narrative that we read and often at Christmas, Mary is speaking to an angel. <laughs> I mean, that seems significant enough already, right? Mary is speaking to an angel, and she has this question moment because the angel has just delivered some news to her. And she says, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the what's the word, everybody? Power. That's another word for might. And the, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I, I just, I mean, to be Mary and, and to experience the overwhelming, overshadowing power of the Most High is, is almost enough. It just, it just can't begin to wrap our minds around. It, the Most High God, the Most Powerful God, it will overshadow you, and you will be with child, and you will call his name the Son of God, and, and behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age and has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, and then it says, for nothing will be impossible with God. 
Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing is impossible for our mighty God. And so the question, the question that I have today is really just simply this. Do you know and trust in the one who is mighty, who declares that there are no impossibilities for him? In all situations, do we declare that our trust is in our God who is mighty and who is mightier than anything that we would ever face or encounter? We see the outcome. Ahaz seeks protection from Tiglath Peleazar in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7. He doesn't trust in the Lord his God. But how many times have we done something similar? And yet today, God is still the mighty God, and He's still inviting us to trust in Him in the same way. He is mighty God. And He makes His might known through the, mir- the miracle of His personhood. Try to imagine an almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, who speaks and things come into being, try to contain himself into the form of a little tiny baby. That shows some might. (laughs) That shows some power. Jesus Christ is, is fully God, fully infant child, and yet fully mighty God. I think that's an illustration of his might and of his power. And and as we see him live life and overcome, the scriptures speak to him as one who is sinless. That shows might. It shows power over the human nature to desire things that the flesh says not to desire. And God would say not to desire, but our flesh wants it. And, And this is... This is not just some ordinary child born. This is God in the flesh. It's the miracle that we celebrate this time of season. And he would continue to display his might as he would teach. And as he would heal the lame. And he would bring sight to those who are blind. And as he would give hope to those who had no hope. And as he would cast out demons. And as he would um, heal and raise even from the dead, as he would speak and the wind and the waves would submit to his voice and his command. Mighty God, Lord Jesus Christ, continually displaying his power. And it's not to show off, but it's to prove that Jesus Christ is Lord and God and his name is still Mighty God. And he is the one who we can turn to in all of our time of weakness and all of our time of overwhelming situations because the Lord Jesus Christ has experienced what we have experienced and has overcome. He is mighty God. And the greatest display, I believe, of his might as a human being is to surrender to the Lord God and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And to take upon himself all of the sin and the shame of all of mankind and to breathe his last, declare that, Lord, it is finished. I have completed the purpose to die the death that we deserve and then to show his power and his might in being risen from the dead, victorious over sin victorious over the grave, so that we too might have the hope of heaven, and that one day we too might declare and share in uh, that same action of might. Because God promised that if we would trust in him, if we would follow him, if we would surrender our lives to him and and, uh, submit in obedience to his word, then, then we have that same promise that we too someday will be mighty as we rise from the grave ourselves. And we stand before our Lord, our, our Lord and our God, who is mighty. And we worship together as one. We serve a mighty God. And it's amazing. 
And so I just want to challenge you and encourage you with this, this passage of Scripture. There's nothing impossible with God. And so whatever it is you might be facing, there's nothing impossible with the Lord our God. He has displayed it throughout the generations, and he will continue to be known as Mighty God. Do you know him as Mighty God? If not, we have a time of, of discussion and invitation. We'd love to share in uh, just an opportunity to spend time looking at the word. And if you've never responded to our mighty God uh, through belief or confession or repentance or baptism, uh, we want to invite you to respond to God in that way. Um, experience the might of our Lord as he washes us and cleans us and forgives us purifies us from all of our unrighteousness. But maybe there's something just uh, overwhelming and you want to spend time in prayer uh, before the Lord our God with someone, we invite you also to that. Uh, We invite you to that. I want to invite you to stand um, and uh, I'll pray to close. But this week, uh, this week, uh, grab your uh, resource sheet, uh, questions, extra take-home stuff, study through that. There's uh, cards at the table uh, off the kitchen, there's some questions there with a passage of scripture to study. Uh, look up in accordance, in, in a concordance, the word mighty and God and, and study it and share that with someone. You'll have opportunities when someone says, man, that was just awesome. Now, let me tell you about something that's awesome. Because that's another word that describes God. Mighty. Uh, share that. You be used as an instrument of God to bring hope uh, to someone uh, this week. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, thank you that we have this opportunity to again look at uh, how you are mighty. And Lord, forgive us when we have uh, just fallen prey to, to the fears that Satan wants to put in our lives where we are worried and overcome even with guilt or or whatever the case might be where we have taken our eyes off you. And we have trusted in in our own advice and our own uh, problem-solving abilities. Lord, help us to rest in you. Thank you for the counsel you give us in your word. And thank you for the, the number of examples that declare your might. Help us to live in that power this week as we share what you have done with those around us. Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.